All right. Welcome everyone uh, to the Special Purpose Operating System Working Group. We are part of Take Runtime that is part of the CNCF. As such, we follow the CNCF Code of Conduct and that um, is available multiple places and on the agenda. So uh, basically be good to each other. Uh, today we have an uh, overview of Kairos um, and we can jump right into it. So I'll hand it over to you. Hello, uh, and by the way, uh, Tore that joined is also in my team. You haven't met him. I'm not sure if you have met him in a previous one. So, yeah, maybe uh, Tore, you want to say hello before I start? Hey. Hello. Yeah, I think we met already. Uh, actually, no, the okay. first time, uh, the first meetings. But yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, then. I'll share my screen then if I find how. Okay, this one should be. Okay, you can see some screen. Which screen do you see? The presentation, I hope. Yeah, looks good. Awesome. Awesome. I can make it full screen as well. Come on, Firefox. There you are. It's full screen. All righty. Um, so, yeah, you know me, but uh, for, for the sake of the recording, I'm Dimitris Karakasilis. Uh, I work for SpectroCloud in their open source team. Uh, which team mainly um, maintains Kairos, uh, develops Kairos. It's one of the main projects. And I'm here to talk about Kairos today. So uh, Kairos is, uh, well, we're in this group, so it's a special purpose OS, like we call it here. So it's an immutable meta distribution, uh, mainly for edge Kubernetes. And these terms will make sense uh, later in this presentation. But uh, what meta distribution means, it's not tied to any specific distro. And um, it's mainly for Edge because you can build other things with it. But uh, we'll focus on the Kubernetes part today. So let me jump right into it. So uh, we'll build operating systems here, mainly for Kubernetes. So we'll know the, uh, how complex it could be, uh, especially at the Edge. And some of the reasons why it is complex there is because for example, the locations are remote, not uh, easily accessible. Uh, you don't always have uh, technical people on site. Um, and you have uh, connectivity limitations or bandwidth limitations, all these things we all know. And it becomes even worse when you go to large scale uh, deployments, where you have hundreds or even thousands of machines to uh, deploy, to, to install and, and maintain and upgrade. Uh, it becomes even harder. And we've seen that enterprises transition to immutable canary-based approaches, uh, scaling out to uh, OS upgrades as well, I like to do with most of the things. So one, one of the approaches Kairos is taking is flexibility. We think it's a key factor because when we're talking about edge, uh, we're talking about uh, special devices. It's not generic devices. Uh, you may be running machine learning uh, workloads or uh, needing special libraries, or you may even have special hardware that needs special drivers. So customization is a key. It's going to be needed and we should allow for that. And that's the approach uh, Kairos is taking uh, and allows users to customize the system to their needs, not the other way around. They don't have to adapt to a new system to adopt Kairos. So it's trying to be vendor neutral and I'll explain how, how it does that in a sec. So um, we think Kairos is, is great for edge computing, and this is how we approach the problem. Uh, first of all, being immutable, we've seen other uh, examples of operating systems that do that. So you pretty much know what this is, but to summarize, there are specific paths in the, in the OS where you can write things. These are the user data, but for anything critical, anything that would affect uh, the operating systems uh, or, or how the operating system works, it's read-only. So you cannot change it. And even if you can change some paths, uh, these are not um, um, persisted. So the next time you reboot, your changes go away um, for the parts which you can write. So um, this is also distribution agnostic, like I said. Uh, it allows A, B upgrades, so you have still have access to your previous, uh, let's say, version of the OS when you upgrade, so you can always uh, revert back to that uh, if your upgrade fails. It has TPM encryption for the user data, 
So your, your data are safe, even if your device is stolen or your disk is stolen. It allows for self-coordinated Kubernetes bootstrap. What I mean there is uh, really self-coordinated self and decentralized. You don't need central components. So uh, the Kairos team doesn't provide any uh, services, hosted services for for uh, people to, to um, self-coordinate their deployments. It's all made through peer-to-peer -peer, um, and secure, of course. And it's easy to configure and maintain. So let, let's see in, in detail. So uh, it is immutable. Well, what we mean here is, is that it converts your distro of preference to an immutable OS. Um, so it's, it all starts with an upstream image, and that's what we convert to an immutable OS. So you can think of Kairos as a, as a framework that brings um, life cycle, immutable life cycle, uh, A, B upgrades and such to your uh, preferred OS. So it's mainly focused on Kubernetes, but we have users running other workloads on Kairos. So we produce two kinds of artifacts. One has Kubernetes, the other doesn't. So you can choose what you build on top. It's highly customizable. It's container based. Uh, but it doesn't have a, a need for a runtime. So it's it's container based, but it doesn't need a, a container runtime to run on. Uh, and it's cloud need driven. So uh, all your configuration to install and upgrade it all comes as a single uh, cloud config, as a single cloud init file. So what do we mean? And wh why is distribution agnostic one more time? Why is it? Uh, again, important. Uh, it's sometimes because of preference. So every team has their own preferences. Maybe because of their know-how, the know-how they gained through the years, uh, or they may have uh, paid for licenses for a number of machines. They may be paying for support for a specific OS, and they don't want to lose that part. Uh, so, uh, and so sometimes you have golden images. I think that th that last one especially applies for uh, special devices, uh, especially for machine learning. You've made the thing work, right? And at that point, you don't want to redo the work. I mean, we've seen that with some devices, some boards we tried out, it takes a while for you to get them running and you really don't want to switch to another OS. So being able to use the, the OS you know, especially with your own image, uh, is really important in some cases. Um, so yeah, how do we do that? Uh, this is a high level overview, not, uh, it's not very uh, deep. We'll see another more detailed slide in a sec, but it starts with an upstream image, um, Ubuntu, Fedora, uh, OpenSUSE, we, uh, we, we see there, but it starts with an upstream image. You pass it through a number of tools. We have a set of tools, which we call the Kairos factory. And that finally creates uh, various different types of artifacts. Uh, ISOs, IMG files to flash them on devices, um, or even netboot artifacts for two different types of uh, uh, final images. One is the core one. Uh, I'm not sure if you see my cursor as well, you should be able to. Um, so one is the core image, um, which doesn't have Kubernetes, and the other one is uh, the standard, what we call the standard image, which has uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, on top. And we also run tests on them. Uh, to be honest, because of the large amount of artifacts we generate uh, with our releases, we don't run the full matrix on all of them, uh, but depending on the kind of test, like if it's a test for OpenRC, for example, we make sure we run it on OpenRC flavors, if it's systemd on a systemd flavor, and we do run the full matrix on, uh, on some of them. Uh, but we produce artifacts for Debian, Fedora, OpenSUSE, Ubuntu, you can find that of that in our release page. So in a bit more detail, um, <clears throat> the way you, you we build the image, and it will make a bit more sense later when I show uh, how users can do the same, um, is you start with a, with a Docker file, which you feed to the Kairos Docker files. Um, so you can have your own Docker files and feed it to the Kairos Docker file, but you can do it afterwards. So this is, let's say you have your own Docker files, you produce your own image, then you feed it to the Kairos factory, let's say, which applies some bits on top, 
uh, this come in the form of another container image. So all the Kairos bits, uh, the the binaries and uh, config and such, they come as a, another OCI image, uh, which you can extract in your own pipeline if you want to uh, re-implement this workflow. But yeah, you feed it to the Kairos, let's say Docker file, and from there, by passing it through some tools we have, uh, you can generate any artifact you want, ISO, Netboot, or just uh, OCI images, which you can use to upgrade after you have installed. All right, uh, regarding installation, how do you install? So we're being flexible there as well. Uh, you either SSH to your machine and you run the installation manually, or if you have physical access uh, to the machine through your keyboard, you can do it locally. Uh, on the right, you see a web UI, uh, which is started uh, when the node boots the Kairos, uh, Kairos ISO. Um, or through the QR code or netboot, which I'm going to explain a little in a bit more detail in the next slide, I think. Um, so you feed it your Kairos config and the installation starts. So this, for example, is the web UI. You can also do it with a QR code. So when the machine boots up, you're presented um, with a QR code. And if you're on the same machine, we have this on the screen, you just run the Kairos register command. Uh, or you just pass it the path to your QR code if you take a screenshot. And this makes sure, so th this QR code has all the information to allow this command, even if you run it on your uh, workstation, to feed it uh, the config and start the installation uh, remotely. The other way is netbooting. So, this, this one is one of, of our favorites because it's fully automated. Um, so we have a tool called Aurora Boot to which you give uh, a container image as input. And then it starts on your network and it advertises itself as a, as a netboot server. So you can start a VM, set it to netboot and it will automatically discover Aurora Boot. Aurora Boot will feed it. Uh, the bootable artifact, the, the ISO, and, and it will boot. Um, and you can even take it further if you enable the optional auto um, configuration, the, the auto coordination, and each one will be uh, connected to the same uh, to the same cluster. So it can be fully automated. You just boot up your net boot machines, and they become part of your uh, of your cluster. Aurora will can also spit out uh, the ISO for you to download and use using a USB stick if you want. Uh, in Aurora, but you also pass the, you can also pass the, the config. So you, you don't need anything else. You pass it the container image and the config and it will make sure the machines boot with that configuration. Regarding immutability, um, the, the OS is completely separated from user data. So, the OS part is immutable. You cannot change. You can write things to your uh, persistent partitions and they can be TPM encrypted uh, optionally. And like I said before, there is no runtime overhead. Uh, so these come as container images, uh, OCI artifacts, but there is no container runtime overhead. There is no runtime to run them. And this is how it works. So if I go back, this is, I'm explaining how things work, how upgrades work in this box here, like the US, right? So th this is what happens. Um, so you, you have an active image, which is the OS you're currently running. Uh, and let's say you upgrade. When you upgrade, a new image is created, the transition image, and that becomes your active for the next boot. And your currently active becomes the passive one. So when, when you boot next time, you boot to your upgrade image, but if things go wrong, you can uh, revert back to the passive one and boot that one. So you don't lose the previously booted OS. Uh, the previously passive one goes away, of course it gets replaced. So it's like a push down kind of strategy. Um, and there is also the, uh, the recovery partition, uh, which is always there. Uh, and you can always boot that. Uh, you have to explicitly uh, upgrade that if you want to change that and make sure you upgrade to a working image, right? So something you have already booted and you're sure it works so you can upgrade your uh, recovery image if you want to. Uh, wait. 
Ah, yeah, I had the recovery. I was looking for the recovery slide. Here it is. So you also have the recovery, which doesn't change with regular upgrades. You have to explicitly upgrade it. Um, and we talked about customizations and that we allow users to change that. So it can happen in two ways. Um, so you can either actually, yes, you, you can either change, start from the Kairos artifact. So you see here we have the uh, the latest Kairos image for OpenSUSE Leap, which is a standard image, uh, including K3S, that is, for MD64, generic devices. Uh, you start from there, you can add your own packages, change, for example, what Kairos has put in OS release and replace with your own versions and such. And you have your own Kairos image after that with all the uh, life cycle we described. Or you can do it afterwards. So you can have your own, let's say, derivative of OpenSUSE, so this has been recently implemented and we are making improvements to that as well to make it even simpler. But you can start from uh, your own derivative, for example, for, for, from OpenSUSE or Ubuntu or one of the, of the flavors we already built. You can feed it to the Kairos factory um, and it, it will convert that to a Kairos. So you may want to do before or after the image or both, like for example, if you want changes that will be there when the neat RAMFS is generated, you, maybe you want to change before you run the Kairos factory. If you want to modify what Kairos does, like here, for example, with the version in OS release, you may want to do that uh, after the Kairos factory. So you may want to do both. So it's really being flexible there. And a little bit about the data encryption, which, uh, I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, so there are two ways, the completely offline uh, scenario in which you uh, have a TPM chip and the passphrase is written there. So this ensures that if your disk gets separated, uh, the, the hard disk gets separated from the TPM chip, which is the device, um, it won't be uh, decryptable. So people won't be able to steal your disk and read your data. Uh, so that's uh, the low level. So the other scenario is even uh, more secure, but requires some setup. So it requires the setup of a, of a KMS server we provide. And in that case, um, you need both the TPM chip and the KMS server to be able to decrypt the device. So part of the, uh, so the passphrase lives on the KMS server, but you still need to authenticate with the TPM chip in order to, to get it. So if someone even steals the device itself, you can block them out by uh, uh, blacklisting uh, the TPM chip in the KMS server, and they won't be able to decrypt your uh, devices, which makes it really important for uh, edge devices, which are usually small in remote locations. You don't always have full control of who has access to them. So it ensures that people can't just steal your device and read your, um, your data from there. So I think that's all I had. Um, there is a lot to talk about. I tried to pick the things I thought would be interesting, but if you want to learn more, you can jump uh, to our site, watch some of our previous videos. We have a monthly meetup at uh, the last uh, Monday of each month where we present latest updates and such. So you can find some of our previous videos in this YouTube channel. Um, and yeah, check the code. You can fetch the last release and try it out yourself. We have a matrix channel you can join and ask questions directly. Um, open a discussion or find us in the office hours. It's Monday at 5.30 CET time. And yeah, I'm happy to listen to any questions you may have, and try to answer them. Are you still there? <laughs> Oh, I see hands raised. Uh, I'm not sure who did that first. Ah. Who was it? Come on. It's just clapping, but awesome. <laughs> that was clapping. <laughs> Thanks for the intro. Uh, I, I do indeed have a have a question. Um, so like the, the minimal Cairo runtime environment that, that you need to deploy in order to manage those custom uh, container images of distros that go on top of that. Um, like, what's the minimum size requirement? That's always an issue in in uh, on on edge systems, I guess. Like, what's the, the the binary size of what you're going to install in order to even function? No, we're talking about disk size or, or in general. For, um, for general, this, I think this we size. have it. Disk size. 
Okay, that depends on the image you are deploying. Not all of them are the same size. And especially when it comes to uh, specific devices, uh, the one we built for NVIDIA Jetson, for example, was rather big. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I don't remember the size of that one. I usually start with 30 gigabytes for regular OpenSUSE one with a standard image. Uh, but you can make it smaller. That, that's a good thing about being able to produce your own. So some of the things we put there, people may not need. So they can start with their own uh, image. And I think the Alpine one, which people seem to favor it uh, for some reason, uh, is even smaller. I think it must be one of, or, or is it the Fedora? The Fedora must be the smaller one. So it depends on the image you use. I, my, my bets are on the Alpine one. I'm a, I'm a big Alpine fan. Maybe. Ah, OK. <laughs> It's mainly because I don't uh, know how OpenRC works that that much, like I do with systems that I, I I don't like it very much. I find it confusing to debug. But... <laughs> yeah, it, it, I think it's a favorite for container images itself because you don't really need um, service orchestration within a container image much. True. Um, as an operating system, I'm a, I'm a huge system defense as well. So that's one of the drawbacks of Alpine. But then they're using a super small C library and there are only a few megabytes. Like the base image is like five megabytes. The, the container base image, which, which I, I find amazing. Okay, cool. Um, thanks. Welcome. All right. Uh, by the way, there is also a Slack channel uh, if people prefer Slack, which is not listed here. Um, but maybe, yeah, I can share it later in the document uh, so people can find it. Uh, with this, I think I can stop sharing. All right, and back to you then. Thank you. That's great. And you said that there's a Slack channel. Is it? I would assume though, is most uh, activity happening in the Matrix uh, channel? They had a bridge, and oh. we think the message is not sure if the bridge still works. Uh, uh, but yeah, we try to reply on both. Uh, so feel free to okay. join whichever you prefer. Yeah. Great. Great, thanks. Any other questions before we move on? All right. Thanks a lot. Um, next up, Tylo, did you have some, just a few random things you want to go over? Yeah, I, that's that's an interesting category. Uh, maybe I just continue this in the in the next meetings. It's just stuff I I come across um, either privately or uh, just you know in my in my daily professional life, um, which I think is interesting for the um, for for us here in the in the working group. Um, and because I just need to get the stuff off my mind. Uh, and still remember it in this meeting, uh, I just started, you know, putting it in there. So there's two things um, that I came across uh, recently. So the first is uh, actually a colleague of mine, Jeremy Piotrowski. He implemented a um, proof of concept uh, kind of uh, proxy between system sys update, what we discussed um, in the previous meeting, and OCI registries. So the idea here is that... Um, on your on your local system, you just run this uh, proof of concept proxy, and then you have a you have a system resource update config file that um, usually only supports HTTPS backends, but it now speaks to the local proxy, and the local proxy basically translates those requests to um, OCI requests, and then you can pull your SysX images from a from a container registry. Now, one of the reasons why I find this uh, interesting is for, for Kairos in particular, because I learned you folks extend your operating system um, using container registries. So I don't know if in the future that makes any sense in, in, in your context as a, as a building block. I really like the idea. Oh, and I mean, if, if you're interested, I can totally um, ping Jeremy to come over in the next office hours or so and, and give a quick uh, demo and Q&A for that. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Cool. All right. I'll, I'll make a note. Ah, I was thinking to myself, sorry. I was double muted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. Sure, that, that would be interesting. Yeah, I agree. Awesome. <laughs> 
And then the other thing that was just, I think yesterday or the day before, um, Leonard uh, just did a quick blog post and um, Mastodon toot on, um, on something that could technically be counted as a uni kernel thing. So he used MKOSI um, to produce the single binary blob that he put in a UF UEFI partition and then um, it's a it's a full Linux system D uh, thing with a little bit of user space. And the reason uh, he did that is he he would make those systems capable of exporting NVMe devices uh, via network, which is a very specific use case. Um, but I really liked the approach, and it reminded me on um, on Felipe, uh, who introduced Unicraft and the, the, his Unikernel in the last session. Um, I mean, they are doing it way more optimized, right? But um, this is um, an interesting generalization because it uses standard components. Um, MKOSI is pretty widely spread. And then the, the system D features he uses is, are probably available, um, widely available as well. So I, I found this um, interesting, maybe regarding distro building. MK, OK. What exactly do they do? They expose local disks over, so they make it network storage. Yeah, they, you basically oh. just put it. You put it into a system, and that system just becomes a network storage. <laughs> ah. I mean, it, it's very specific, and he just did it to scratch his own itch. But I really like it as a as kind of a proof of concept of of what can be done. Nice. Victor has a great question in the chat. And uh, since I'm done, you want to you wanna speak up, Victor? Yeah, just curious. I mean, a, a lot of the stuff here, and I need to go back and listen to understand even the basics. Uh, so uh, it's too advanced for me. But just I, I try to understand for a higher, higher level um, how how special means. Uh, like in this case, uh, like Dental has his, uh, you know, their focus is becoming the network operating, operating system because Sonic's already known to be the network operating system that's popular now, right? So Dental OS is for focusing on the edge. Uh, and then more uh, try to work with all devices. That's how they their niche special. And like for the special OS uh, in in this group, what what is a special? I guess where to um, other than the technical details, what is it go for? What is it for? A special sauce for? Well, I think in, in our case, uh, really, it's it's technically it's anything that's not just a general purpose distribution. Um, it, in our case, or for our purposes, at least initially, uh, it's really focused on being able to run containers in a cloud native environment. So, you know, typically uh, Kubernetes node or, or something like that, just focused mainly on what do you need to run a container um, or wasn't. Yes. Uh, uh, the, the, you know, the definition can certainly expand. Um, we tried to capture a little bit in the mission statement. Um, and I know initially, you know, pointing out that wasm thing, initially we were very specific uh, about just running containers. Uh, but that question was brought up as we were going through the review for adding this charter. Well, what about these other things that can be cloud native, but aren't necessarily um, containers? So yeah, we, we hope it does expand more into WASM. Um, I don't know if network operating system is probably, it's a special purpose OS. I, I, I guess we would have to discuss it if that makes sense for this group. Um, but I would see over time, it, it, this could evolve and include other things that we're not currently talking about. And, and I find it very useful. Uh regardless of what exactly is the special purpose, not being general purpose is, uh, is the interesting part because you can see how many things you can cut, right? Cut access to, uh, like limit the attack surface to the minimum. So that's why we see many of, of the OSs are uh, read-only, right? So you can see how many things you can cut and still be uh, useful for that specific use case, things you can't do on a general purpose OS. Be 
great if there's more like details on I mean, all of this are very advanced, interesting technical details that need to go back and watch the recording again to understand even the basics. It's just that if you know like more of a, what, what is the, I guess the end game sort of, what what is purpose of that special board? The, the question is very good in, in multiple ways um, because it just got me thinking about uh, your your search for summary, right? Like, is there a summary page where you could say Bottle Rocket is specialized in this and that direction because it does this one thing very well and uh, it uses the following mechanics and then maybe like here's an intro and then link to our video. Um, now, probably pretty pretty cool to have uh, something we should probably drag along with the action items and then um, start a markdown going on that. Great input. Yeah. I find myself uh, struggling sometimes when I visit a page of a, of a project I didn't know before to understand what it does. So there's so much buzzword there in every page right even hours like ours i mean you have to put it there because people expect that and it just checks the boxes sometimes uh confirming that this is what they're looking for but for other people trying to understand what it is sometimes it's very hard and what the use case is it for me is it not is it similar to the other one i was checking 10 minutes ago this is really really hard to do <laughs> And I will say this is kind of why we wanted something like this and these overviews of the different projects, because I think mm -hmm. we're all out doing things and maybe calling things slightly differently or, or categorizing them differently. So I, at least for me, the useful thing with these project overviews of you know getting a better understanding, what are we doing the same? What are we doing different? How, how do these projects relate to each other? So um, yeah, great idea to start a doc and start capturing some things, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping we eventually end up with white papers and I don't know, definitions and, and things like that, that can help, you know, not, not just us, the people working on them, but the people that are kind of curious so that they understand what we're working on and whether it meets their needs or not. Right. Anything else? There's nothing else on the agenda. Uh, there's one action item, action item follow up that I think uh, would be good to talk about. Uh, but before we get to that, any anything else? Felipe, I saw you just you joined late, right? Yeah, apologies. Uh... <laughs> Had a bit of a minor football injury and I had to go to the hospital, get some x-rays, all good. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, ho yeah, hope it works out for you. Wow, that's... All good, all good, yeah. The, the, the thing I brought to today's meeting is I ran across a Mastodon tool that Leonard did on um, something that could technically be interpreted as a unikernel. So your, your name immediately popped into my mind. It's not, it's way not what you folks are doing. Uh, but it's an interesting approach because it kind of generalizes uh, the way that it, it's just a, basically uh, a put together uh, like one binary Linux system that just boots and then um, uh, it's an entirely UEFI uh, control, so not even disk usage. It's just it's an extended BIOS, so to say, and then. Um, it's it's very very specific, but I like the way kind of the tools that he uses to to arrive there. Um, that's an that's an interesting proof of concept. Awesome, I'll I'll check it out. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, most of the work we do is kind of cloud focused, but there are a lot of people in the OS community that, because everything is modular, see it as a very uh, nice way to build absolutely minimal things. So yeah. then they deploy it on directly bare metal or embedded devices. There's automotive industry people in there doing automotive virtualization and they use it for critical domains because certification is faster. So there's other applications than the ones we mainly work on that are applicable to Unikernels and Unicraft.
All right, do we want to talk about KubeCon? Yeah. So are we having a meetup in, in Paris? Uh, that's the that's the good question, right? We would need a subject, I guess. Uh, so I'm not sure if any everybody knows. Is it in the notes what, what we wanted to discuss? So it was about having a, a panel there, a discussion. Yeah. Uh, among us, so we we up, um, apply uh, as a group, and maybe some of us maybe maybe we were too many for for a panel, but we can send some of us there and discuss. But yeah, we we don't have a concrete subject yet. We don't know exactly. So this was about brainstorming. I think the deadline is very close. Uh, 25th of November. So mm -hmm. it's it's a little bit of time. I brought up a proposal. Um, Basically, seconding the the forms that you get when you when you apply um, at KubeCon, and um, Dims was nice enough to review that. Got a bit of input from uh, our working group as well. We had a bit of discussion in the chat. The proposal is here. Um, I I want to loop this through um, like a few folks on my end uh, for polishing. I don't expect major changes. Um, and uh, so my 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 next step would be have you folks look at it again, um, see if you're happy with it. Um, and um, so right now we have four participants. We can we can host up to five. Uh, and like given the traction that I got with some of you folks and uh, the non traction that I got with everybody else in the chat, I would say first come first serve. So the the fifth people as uh, the fifth person entering their name they will be part of the panel and then um and then we wrap it up uh i would submit it i don't know early or mid next week so there's the week uh, weekend that we can basically um have this soak a little um and uh, i would ping you folks in the channel anyways uh to make sure that you're even available for for kubecon when i enter you in the panel I just found the link. I didn't see there was a link. Okay, we will have to read this and yeah. We'll awesome. discuss with the team. Perfect. Hopefully we can add one of our names there. Um so everybody's already on the panel participants. That is Sean, me, Justin, and Felipe. Justin's not here today, so I gotta ping him. Can you please enter your email addresses? Because I probably need to enter those in the uh Sean, will it be you or Kyle? Uh, I think me. Um, but awesome. but yeah, we can. We'll we'll try to lock that down. <laughs> and I was thinking too. Uh, they they usually do the tag, meet and greet. Um, I don't know if we could. It'd be great to actually, you know, in addition to a panel, if we get this panel. Yeah. Actually. Get together as a group either there or, or maybe we just try to arrange our own thing to um i know in detroit a, a bunch of people just met up at a diner and you know, had lunch together that was just a nice casual thing to get everyone together uh i'd love absolutely. to see that happen absolutely this could be a wider loop um oh uh something else that that and i'll, I'll add it to the uh to the doc right away something else that uh came to my mind when looking uh through the panelists is I mean, we can we can do a cutoff at five people on on the stage, but it doesn't stop other folks attending the talk and basically being part of the panel, but only in the audience, right? Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm definitely good for for having a dinner. That would be great. I agree. Also about the the tag uh, event. Yeah. We're not all located in Europe, right? Come again? We're not in Europe, all of us. I mean, uh, at least uh, today, whoever is here, we're not all located in Europe. So it would be hard to meet. If outside KubeCon, yes, but KubeCon is an opportunity. Um, yeah. I'm checking in from Berlin, so. I guess this question is, are there people in this group that are from the US who might not make it to Paris? 
Ya. <laughs> But okay, let, let's see if we get accepted first and then we see who goes and yeah, whoever is already there, we, we can meet that. That's a very nice idea. For, yeah. the, for, for the panelists, I would absolutely expect them to pop up, right? Because they're, <laughs> yeah, they, I, I they think we name. Have... <laughs> they sign up for this. Yeah. <laughs> and it can be tricky that um, sometimes you need to get the talk accepted before the company is willing to, to send you, so... <laughs> I guess that's just, yeah, anyone that puts your name on there, expect that if this happens, that you've got to find some way to get to Paris. <laughs> uh, we'll be there anyways, because we have a booth to men, so. And Tilo, th thanks for writing this. Uh, I completely forgot that uh, we had to come up with ideas, so <laughs> you came very prepared. Thanks. <laughs> all good. All good. Yeah. yeah like like Dim said, I, I love the title. That is a great way to put it. <laughs> okay. Anything else for today? All right. I guess that's it then. Um, our next, uh, let's see, our next meeting is uh, first week in December on the 7th, and we'll have Google Container OS. Um, and yeah, any other topics, please add it to the agenda. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Good everybody. You again. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Have a nice day. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye bye.